venues this year. Um, there, there are a bit much of you for in the bookstore. Um, clap for those wonderful cosplayers, if you would. like that. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to blab at you guys for around 45, 50 minutes, something like that. Um, and if you've ever been to one of these before, you know, you give Professor Sanderson a microphone and he starts talking. This is what happens. Um, and basically, I'll talk about something that's a little bit related to the book, but again, if you've been to these before, they aren't terribly always that relevant, but it's what I'm thinking about at the time. Um, after that, we will do a Q&A for a little bit. Um, I'll just call on people in the crowd, and, uh, and we'll do that for a little while. And then I have a reading for you. Um, I will read to you from Stormlight Book 4. So. is a lie that I tell you and have been telling you. Uh, this is actually a lie that's very common. A lot of media is going to tell you this lie. Um, and I've been thinking about it a lot lately. The, the lie is actually that um, you can do anything you want. And you can be anything you want. This is a really cool phrase, right? You can do anything. Um, it sells books really well. It sells media really well, things like that. The problem is it's, it's, it's not true. Um, and to kind of, kind of explain why and some things about this, let me tell you some stories. We put up on the, um, the, uh, the, the um, screen right here would be uh, the first award I ever won. Uh, this happened when I was 18 years old. What happened was I was in high school, I was going to um, my AP English class, and my teacher walked in, and he was a good teacher. I really liked this teacher. He did not get sci-fi fantasy at all, but he did his best with me. Um, and this is a sign that he was a good teacher. Someone put in his box an, a flyer for a writing contest, a local science fiction fantasy writing contest. They looked at it, and they thought, and they walked to the classroom, and he put it on my desk, and he said, I think this is for you. Um, and I had been writing stories off and on, but I'd never really thought about showing them to anyone. In fact, I um, famously, uh, I've told this story before, I would write on a story or something, and I'd be so nervous that people would read it that I would uh, hide it behind the picture frame in my room so no one found it. Um, I was very shy about my writing, and this was the first time I ever showed any of my writing to anyone. I, I wrote a story, and I submitted it to this writing contest. Um, the story itself is on my website. You can go read it. It's really bad. Um, but for an 18-year-old, it wasn't too bad uh, for one of his first efforts. Um, and I actually I won that writing contest. Um, yeah. I took, uh, there were five entries, and I took first. Um, I think you have to start small, right? Um, and I overcame quite the, uh, quite the, uh, the obstruction in doing that. You see, I accidentally, when I, uh, after I won my award, they gave me $50 though, by the way, savings bond. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I went up to talk to the organizers of the contest, and they said, yeah, your story was really interesting, because we were reading it, and we thought, wow, he's doing some really avant-garde really interesting, weird thing with this. And then we realized you had stapled your story backward. <laughs> and it wasn't a weird avant-garde thing. You just took it right out of the printer and stapled it and turned it in. And yes, I had done that. So they rearranged it and read it in the right order. Um, <laughs> and somehow I still won the prize. I have no idea how that happened. Um, but that gave me a taste, um, a taste of victory. Um, and so, years later, when I first broke in, the next award I was up for was the Campbell Award. We can go to the next slide. 
Um, the Campbell Award is given at the Hugo Awards, right? Um, it is basically the Rookie of the Year Award. And I really wanted to win this award, right? It was the second award I'd ever been up for, and I won the first one. So obviously, right, I can win this one. Um, now there's something going a lot around this time where I had gotten published, and another author had gotten published right around the same time. His name's John Scalzi. Um, and some of you might know where this is going because it was this weird thing where that year after Elantris came out, everywhere I went, everyone was talking about John Scalzi. Um, and I went to multiple bookstores to sign my books, and I don't know how he'd done it, but he had always gotten there first, and his books were all displayed, signed, before me. Um, and he's right next to me in the alphabet, and I started saying, who is this Scalzi guy? Right? Who is he? Um, I even, you know, started, every time I encountered him, started saying, Scalzi! And shaking my fist through the air, kind of a good, uh, William Shatner, uh, imitation there. Um, and then, the Campbell Award nominations got, uh, came out and the, the shortlist, and lo and behold, Scalzi was nominated. And I'm like, ah, Scalzi, who is this guy? So I read his book, and that was dangerous because his book was really good. <laughs> I don't know how why appropriate it is, but it was really good, and I'm like, oh no. Oh no. Um, and uh, my friends, and we all went to the convention where the award is given out, and lo and behold, John Scalzi won the award. Now, this isn't that big a deal, right? Um, you lose some, you win some. But the thing is, the Campbell Award, you're only eligible for two years. And the next year I lost to Naomi Novik, who's another fantastic writer. And that was it. No matter how much I wanted to win the Campbell Award, I could not do it. It, it just couldn't happen. Um, and this is kind of related to this idea, right? We say, chase your dreams, you can do anything. But you really can't, right? Like, we all understand that, deep down. Like, what if you would ask me when I was a teenager, what do I really want? Nothing's off the table, what do I really want? I'd be like, I want a pet dragon, right? <laughs> I mean, obviously, right? Um, no amount of dreaming and hoping and wishing and working really hard would get me a real pet dragon, a stuffed animal, yes? You know, I can become a fantasy writer, but there, there are things you just can't do. And I worried sometimes that um, in writing fiction, we, we focus on this idea of how important it is to chase your dreams. Um, and I talk about it a lot, right? I chased my dreams and became a novelist, which was, you know, not that easy to do. And it worked for me. And sometimes I worry that, you know, we have this message of just go chase your dreams no matter what it is and go for it. And then we're surprised when people get discouraged and things like this. Like, um, it's, it's kind of a downer, isn't it? Um, to have a speech, my big book launch, super, let's get all riled up speech being, no, you can't. Um, it's not really what I want to get into, but to make everyone a little bit happier, I did bring a picture, um, let's go to the next one, of my nephew. Uh, next slide, please, in a doom slug outfit. Uh, yeah, maybe that'll, uh, maybe that'll have to make everyone um, a little bit more, a little more happy. Um, so why am I bringing this up? Well, I think the issue is, the thing that worries me, the thing that bothers me, is that when we say, just chase your dreams and go for it, we actually ignore a lot of the practical side of what going for it means. Um, and that's what I want to kind of talk about today. Kind of talking you through me writing books and what going for it means to me. Um, because I write some big books, right? Um, I write some smaller books and I write some larger books. Um, and the book I'm writing right now is Stormlight Book 4, uh, right? Uh, these books are really hard to write. Uh, to give you an, a visualization for those who may not have launched into them, let's go to the next slide. So, um, the Hunger Games trilogy, all three books together, is 300,000 words, right? And then the next slide, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia are about 340 thousand words, the entire series, right? The last Stormlight book, next slide please. <laughs> Don't applaud me. This is <laughs> I get together with like Brandon Gold, he's like, do you realize that one of your books is like 10 of my
mine. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, it's hard to write short, and it really is. But I love big, epic fantasies. This is just, you know, I like to do a lot of different things. That's why you're here, to read a, to read a star sight. Um, because I kind of have this thing where I, once I finish a book, I need to write something very different to try something new to refresh myself. But the thing I keep coming back to are these big epic fantasies, kind of my first love. Um, and they're really big. Um, and it's very easy, if you maybe wanted to be a writer, like I wanted to be a writer when I was young, to look at some of these very, very big books and be like, well, I want to do that. Um, and then run into the reality of doing that is really hard. And not a lot of people talk about doing it. They say, go chase your dream. I tried chasing my dream with the first book that I tried writing when I was a teenager, and it was an enormous disaster. Right? I had no idea how to accomplish something this huge. Um, in fact, it's, it's good that I got this thing on my desk that said submit a short story, because I'm like, well, I guess I should write one of those. Um, and that proved to be a nice stepping stone, helping me out. But at the end of the day, like, I want to do this. How do we do this? What do you do in order to actually achieve your dreams? Rather than just saying, go for it. You can be anything. What, would I, what advice would I give? Um, so I've kind of boiled it down to kind of three ideas that maybe will be helpful for you. Hopefully, there are young people here who are like, I do want to chase my dreams, Brandon. Um, what would you recommend? And the first thing I would say is, you got to learn to break it up. Um, point number one, how do you write a book the size of Oathbringer? You actually write it in a lot of the same ways that you would write a very short story. And that is, you break it into manageable pieces. You just do way more of them. Oh, yes. Um, you just do way more of these pieces for a large book. And now, it's not that easy, right? Because you have to maintain all of these interlocking and interweaving um, plot lines, which takes practice. Um, but that practice is its own quantum, right? It's its own thing you can divide off and say, I don't know how to become, like when I was doing these things, I'm like, I want to become Robert Jordan. How do I do that? No idea. Well, one of the ways you become Robert Jordan is you start writing every day a little bit and you start practicing. You break down the monumental, oh, did I get that one right, Peter? I did, didn't I? Uh, you break down the monumental task of becoming a professional author by first starting on learning how to construct a good paragraph, how to put a scene together, and things like this. Like, um, I don't want to tell you, don't shoot for the stars, but I also want to tell you, if you want to get to the stars, there are some steps you need to take along the way, and you should focus on those because you can approach those. You may not be able to approach writing Oathbringer, that size of book. In fact, the second time I tried it, I was a well-established author. I hadn't sold yet, but I knew what I was doing, and I failed then, too, because doing a book that big is just really hard, even for someone who by then had written a Elantris and had written a bunch of books that were pretty good. So if you want to do this, the, you know, the, the realistic side of it is break it down. Ask yourself what small steps you could be taking today that can point toward that. But that's not the whole of it. Uh, number two, point number two, is learn how to trick yourself. This one is really important. And this is the one I don't think we talk about nearly enough. Right? We may talk about, you know, go, go chase your dreams, but we also like to pretend in society, at least I've noticed, that we pretend that there are people who do and people who don't. And there's just like almost a sense that there's this imaginary dividing line, and you're either on this side, you're an achiever, you're a go-getter, or you're not. And I don't believe that at all. I, I don't believe it one bit. What I do believe is there are people who have learned how to trick themselves into doing things they want to have done, and people who haven't yet figured that out yet. The secret is we all, well, it's different for everybody, but for me, we all want to be sitting and playing video games, right? <laughs> yeah, right? Or reading books, or we don't want to go to the gym. We don't want to, we want to be a famous author, but we don't actually want to write books, um, which is kind of an essential step in there. Um, in fact, if I talk to my writer friends, the majority of them will say, you know, I don't actually like writing, but I like having written. 
Um, I actually do like writing. Um, I enjoy it quite a bit, but the, the issue is, um, for me, when I have to buckle down is when I have to revise. I hate revision, right? Absolutely hate it. I would, if, if this is part of why, if you guys have heard, I wrote 13 books before I sold one, and the, part of the big reason for that was is I would write a book, I would be like, oh, that was fun, I'll put it aside and I'll write another one, and maybe that one will be better. Um, and instead of learning how to make the books I've written into publishable great books, I just always wanted to be done with them. Um, and whatever it is you do, the thing that you want to shoot for the stars, there will be parts of it that are not very fun for you. So no matter who you are, you have to learn this trick of how you trick yourself into having done what you want to do. Like I said, I don't think we talk about it enough. And this is partially because I think it's really individualized. Like what motivates people can be really specific to you. I can tell you what motivates me. So what motivates me is spreadsheets. <laughs> doesn't sound very exciting, does it? Um, I was, my mother's an accountant. She trained me well. Um, and this will actually make a little more sense when I explain it. I really like keeping track of my daily work count and watching it count toward a goal. You ask why I have the progress bars on my website? Because I was doing that even before I was published and had a website. Because uh, uh, if there are any, any of you here who like video games, how much fun is it to watch your experience bar inch toward something, right? Like going out and killing a thousand rats to get gain level two, that's not fun. But that ding when you become level two and you get a new magic spell, that is fun. You don't want to kill rats, you want to have killed rats, right? Uh, and the video game makers know very well how to motivate us by showing things counting up. And I found that if I create a spreadsheet that shows me counting toward a finished goal when I'm revising, if I'm like, all right, if I do 10,000 words a day, that's the, the book is 100,000 words for something like Star Sight, and then that will be 10% a day, and I only have to do 10 days of this, and I can watch it count up, and then bing, I've got the reward. The book is better. People will enjoy it more when they read it, and I will have done the thing that I want to have done. Um, this, is, this takes work, figuring out what it is that actually motivates you. Um, it takes experimenting, it takes practice. Um, it's difficult, um, but it's way easier than simply saying, I want to do this thing, and then go. And just assume that the intrinsically nice nature of it, the intrinsically valuable nature of it, will, um, will motivate you. Um, I'm religious, right? I want to read my scriptures every day. For years, I'm like, I want to read my scriptures every day. That's really good for me. Really, I wanted to have read my scriptures every day, right? Because that would be really good for me. Um, and for years, I just wasn't doing it. And yet, it totally took a little tweak. When I started, I made a habit of, well, before I start typing on my book that day, I have to have read my scriptures. And that's my reminder. And it became a habit. I just started doing it, right? And now it's been decades where I haven't forgotten because the thing I already do basically every day, I just put this in front of it. Now, I think there's this sense in society that if you were truly virtuous, you would just want to do that and you would go and you would lose track of time and seven hours would pass and you'd be like, oh, that's what I say I meant, right? Um, <laughs> But they're not me. For me, I needed a daily reminder and something that I already did every day and just slot this thing into it. And suddenly, it's been decades and I haven't missed a day. Tricking your brain is the actual secret to success. Um, and then I would say that the last one, uh, kind of to wrap this up, the last thing that I thought of is, you know what, be willing to change your goals if as you go along, you figure out something you want better or something that's more realistic. We don't talk about this basically ever, right? Uh, we say chase your dreams, not chase your dreams until you realize they're unrealistic and then settle for something that's a little more plausible, <laughs> right? But that is actually a really good thing to internalize, the difference between giving up and reassessing. 
The difference, like, whatever it is that you want to do, once you get involved in it, you will learn and grow and become better and realize, right? When I was a kid, I played trumpet. And I had goals to, of becoming a trumpeter, right? Um, the more I practiced and the further I got, the more I realized what I liked about playing trumpet was having the community of band in high school to be my friends. And the actual trumpet playing was fine, but I didn't need to become a professional trumpet player. In fact, I really didn't want to because practicing the trumpet was not very much fun. And beyond that, all the things that I would put in place that made me do it, I just didn't still enjoy it. Yet when I would write books, I would find out that once I got myself doing it, hours would pass and I would feel really satisfied and fulfilled after doing it. When I went to college, I changed my goals. I said, you know what, I'm not going to continue doing the trumpet. It did what I wanted it to do. It made me good friends in high school and gave me a nice group. And now that I'm in college, I'm done. I'm going to focus on writing. I have never <coughs> felt like I gave up because as a more experienced and mature person, I changed my goals based on my experience. Um, and this should be okay to do, right? This is a secret to success, I really think it is, to learning to, as you get more experience, you become wiser saying, well, this is what I actually want. Um, why did I want to win the Campbell Award? Um, because I was very worried as a new writer that I wouldn't make it. I heard that a lot of new writers published their first book and vanish. That's why I wanted to, read, to win the award. And when I kind of dug down into that, I realized, you know what? I can still make that happen. The award doesn't matter. Um, and in fact, my friends, after there's a, there's a big party at the convention, uh, afterward, it's uh, the Hugo Losers Party, is what they call it. And um, I was sitting at the Hugo Losers Party, and by the way, um, George Martin walked by, he writes the Game of Thrones books, and he says, ah, don't worry, kid, I lost that award the first year it was offered. Um, and then he gave me a little badge that said Hugo Loser on it, which is very nice, <laughs> um, that I could wear around. And then my friends came up to me, and let's go to the next slide. Um, and they had gone to the Lego store and built me a Hugo rocket out of Legos. <laughs> and that's John Scalzi. They had him sign it, and they gave me the first ever Scalzi Award. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Isaac, was it Isaac? Uh, yeah, well there's, there's my Scalzi Award. Um, and you know what? <laughs> I'm much more happy with my Scalzi Award. Um, and I did, we can go next slide. I did eventually win some Hugo Awards, so we do have that going. Um, but for me, you know, my life has been about learning to break down what I want to do. Trick myself into doing it, and then deciding if it's really what I want to do. And after I've been involved with this a long time, I really came to the decision. What do I want to do? I want to write epic fantasy novels. I had no control over whether I would become famous or successful or not. The only thing I had control over was was I writing books that I really loved. And that's kind of become, well not kind of, that's become my guiding light. Keep myself focused. I moved my goals. My goal was to keep writing books that I love no matter what, which that was very liberating, very liberating. I've never really had to take jobs that I didn't want to take. I've always taken jobs I wanted to. I've always worked on books I wanted to because my goals are focused on doing what I sincerely think is going to make me the most happy, and that is being, um, writing the books. Um, and as a kind of caveat um, to the end here, I did eventually get my dragon. Now, Dragons aren't real, yes. But I sat there and thought, you know, what, uh, what, what makes me like dragons? If I boil it down. Well, they are, um, they can fly, that's cool. They are basically flying dinosaurs, right? Um, they can talk and they're intelligent, and they look cool. Um, I thought about that for a while, and next slide, please. I went and I bought a parrot, right? <laughs> <laughs> who's, uh, who's super cute, and he talks, and he is a flying dinosaur, quite literally. Um, so, I hope this is helpful to you, and um, I hope that you can kind of use this to kind of cut through the lie, the lie that you can do whatever you want and see the truth behind it, because the truth behind it does mean something. When people are telling you this, they're saying, you can achieve great things, and you really can. 
but also be a little practical. This is what my mother, the accountant, taught me, that a little practicality, tempering wild expectation and dreams, is what actually makes it happen. Thank you guys very much.